but I decided uh, actually on eighth grade, I was a short track class, but I love sports. I assume all of you are sports fans. And uh, here, do you all play tennis? Yes. This is a tennis team. And uh, so I kind of, I actually have a vague memory of writing a paper in the eighth grade that someday I would be a sports writer for the LA Times. Back in, when I was in school, everybody read newspapers every day. There was no internet. It was just newspapers were communicating. So, <coughs> Essentially, going to talk a little bit about my journey from Strathmore High School to a 30 plus year career as a nationally known sports columnist for the Los Angeles Times. And just so I wrote a book during the pandemic, and uh, let me see. Here. This is what the book is. And the reason it's my up close view, because I was best known, I wrote about sports announcers and the business of sports broadcasting. So I'm very, for 35 years, I had a column in two different LA papers. One was a LA Herald Examiner, the other one was the LA Times. And I went to Fresno State, but the turning point of everything that happened later in my life happened pretty much when I was in high school. And it started with, I had some, some guys coming over to pick me up for the first day of football practice. And I love sports, I played. I went to Jefferson School in Lindsay through the fifth grade, and then my parents bought 20 acre orange grove east of Strathmore. So I went to Strathmore Elementary beginning in sixth grade. And uh, I, I played Little League football they had Little League, what they, they didn't call it Pop Warner, they called it Little League football, tackle football in Lindsay. So I was really anxious to go out for football in high school, but I was 5'1", 102 pounds. So I was going to be sitting on the bench and only moderate speed. So my mother was the correspondent for this area, for the Fresno B, for Lindsay Strathmore, and she talked me into being a correspondent. Uh, and that scrapbook that I, that I took out, I'll show you. It was, this was in the library. I donated some of my scrapbooks that I wrote. So I got my first byline where it said, by Larry Stewart, when I was 14 years old as a freshman. So writing during high school. And it helped me in so many ways. I was insecure, shy, I was small. So I, you know, like seventh and eighth grade, I got fully. And uh, when, I, when I found this niche and started writing, this is my freshman and sophomore year. And you, I, I, I donated this. Let's see my, I'll just show you. This is probably my first byline in 1960 where it says, by Larry Stewart. So I was pretty diligent in keeping all my, the articles that I wrote about. And uh, I don't want to just talk about myself. I want you guys to ask me some questions or tell me what maybe you're interested. Do any of you, it was so important. One thing I want, I always am, I belong to the Time Speaker Bureau. By the way, I could not get up in front of class and talk. In the eighth grade, I knew the Gettysburg Address backwards and forwards, but when I got up in front of class, it just froze. Four score and seven years ago, my mind would go blank. And my teacher said, okay, Larry, sit down. We'll call on you later. Three times I got out. Three times I failed. Even by, in college, I took speech my freshman year, and I got sent to a speech therapist. The speech therapist says, well, you seem to talk okay. And I said, I just can't talk in front of a group. But now I've actually been paid to make speeches. There was a speak the Times had a speaker bureau, and they sent me out all the time. Talked to school kids, church groups, different rotaries, service clubs. When I was up here a year ago, I talked to three rotary clubs in Visalia. So I overcame my shyness, became more confident, because I wrote 
the, the athletes kind of like me because they like to see their name even though the Strathmore Sentinel, which no longer exists, it was a four-page supplement to the Lindsay Gazette, but it really helped me to find a niche and set that goal. Have, have any of you thought about what you're going to do as a career or even, I just think it's so important, even though, okay, I want to say, my goal is to someday play at Wimbledon. Well, that may be a little far-fetched, but to have that goal is going to help you along the way. It's going to help you work harder in school. You're going to learn about how important networking is and getting along with people and being popular. And what I mean by popular, not just you're like the stud of your class. After you get through your teenage years, the people just like you because they like being around you. All of that stuff is really important, and that's what I emphasize to kids. Set a goal, remain focused, it kind of keeps you out of trouble. Not that I had a perfect record as a, as a kid. I got busted for drinking beer twice when I was in high school. But I didn't do drugs, and that was the drug era, the 60s. That's when cocaine was coming. Then uh, a roommate of mine came from Strathmore. Brilliant student. He was going to make the football team good looking, got into drugs and turned out to be a terrible roommate in his whole life. So if you set a goal, remain focused, you work harder, uh, it really helped me to achieve. But one thing I want to emphasize that, uh, did we get set up on the, uh, yes, you're ready to go. Uh, I'll show a few.
did I call you when I did that story for the register? I can't remember. No. And uh, I make a few phone calls, and uh, they read the story. And the neat thing, when I was in high school, we couldn't have done this. The story was on the internet. When I came up for homecoming, uh, you know, you go around to the classes, and three or four of us alums go into a class and tell them who we are. So I told them, all right. I said, did any of you, I said, I wrote a story in one of the LA papers about Strathmore High School. Did anybody here happen to see it? They all raised their hand. Because I guess they all got the link to the story. So I go to the game, I get a press credential, and I started walking the sidelines of Strathmore High School football games in 1960. 57 years later, I was walking the sideline in the Strathmore game in Orange County. And uh, so uh, that's when I kind of got to know Jeremy. So I thought, this story could make a movie. There was a Disney movie made that came out in 2015 about cross country at McFarland High School. And it was, it was a well-received movie. So I thought, well, this could be a movie too. And this isn't cross country, this is football. So I wrote my treatment, it's probably too long. My daughter, who's in the entertainment business, says, you, you wrote too much here, but CBS came very close to doing a suit. They, we had phone conversations. CBS was going to do a Super Bowl pregame feature. They said, we, we thought about it. And, what, <coughs> and I talked to a producer from this McFarlane movie, other well-known <coughs> producers. I tried to sell it to the New York Times, ESPN. And finally, I was, I just thought, well, I tried. You know, it's probably not the result. Actually, with the pandemic, where I had some time, also inspired me to write the book. And so the last chapter is all about Strathmore High School football. So that kind of, if nothing else, I didn't write this book to make money. It's hard to make, unless you're a well-known author and you have an agent and you have a publisher that gives you an advance because you've written a bestseller. Well, I, don't, I didn't have that advantage. Uh, it's actually a good story for you guys to know how I got this book published. Uh, right before the pandemic, in January 2020, a senior at the, at the high school of 3,000 students where I live in Arcadia, California, right next to Pasadena, this a uh, lot of Asians live there, and especially in, in high school, a lot of Asians. And a, a senior there named Jeffrey Lee wrote me an email and said, Hey, I'm working on a school podcast on Santa Anita, and I'm told that I should talk to you. Well, somebody <coughs> told him that I've covered, I've covered the Kentucky Derby, and I've covered horse racing, and I knew a lot about uh, Santa Anita, the racetrack in Arcadia. And uh, so <laughs> we'll show a, a few more pictures in a minute. Do you, is, is, so I need to click on this. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll put the book cover up. There we go. Uh, so this young man I didn't know just took the initiative to write to me and ask me if, if he could interview me. He wanted to meet someplace at a Starbucks or an interview. Well, I checked with the principal of the high school who I knew, and I said, gee, do you know a student, Jeffrey Lee? And it's a big high school, so I wasn't sure. Oh, yeah, he's a great kid, great student. Yeah, you should help him. So I said, instead of just meeting and you talk to me, have you been to the track? And he said, well, I was there with a friend. Well, the racetrack, it's a very well-known racetrack for horse racing. Santa Anita is located in Arcadia. So I said, well, why don't I take you out to the track? And so he went out and he got all these interviews. And he was so grateful. Oh, Mr. Stewart, oh, this is great. And he kept in contact. And during the pandemic, and one of the emails, he said, so how are you doing? I said, well, I'm using the downtime to write a book. Now, I'm older, so I'm not real 
tech savvy. Us old guys sometimes have trouble. Maybe your, your grandparents have, have a little trouble with computers and all this, this tech world we live in. And so he says, well, Amazon has a program you can, you can, uh, you can use, I'll, I'll help you. And I, so I said, really? How much does it cost? Oh, it don't cost anything. You just have to do it all yourself. He says, I, I don't have the skill to do that. He says, well, I'll help you. And I said, great, I'll, I'll pay you. Oh, you don't have to pay me. Well, I did pay him. He didn't know what he was getting into. It was a bigger project. He had published a small little book. And I had written books for other people <coughs> who self-published them. Uh, and they paid a lot of money and ended up giving the books away. So uh, the book didn't cost much to publish, but Amazon takes a big chunk out of every book. So I would have to sell tons of books to make a significant amount of money. 95% of self-published books lose money. And right now I'm really close to breaking even. So if anybody wants to buy a book, I, I have a student discount for you. <laughs> so, and I'm donating, I think this box, uh, this box to the, the district to put in a library here. Let's see, is this the one? Yeah. I have some paperback with color pictures and paperback with black and white pictures. And I've kind of quit publishing the one with black and white pictures because it wasn't selling very much. And the color book is just, it's just so much nicer. And then it's hardcover and, and, and paperback. But uh, I'm hoping, you know, I'm, I came up because I was invited to the football uh, Boosters Club is having a dinner tomorrow night to honor, I think, seven inductees that are going into the Football Hall of Fame. So they, I was invited to come up to that. So I met Pete at the uh, Lindsey Strathmore football game and knew that he was on the school board. So I emailed Pete and we'd hope to have maybe more students from the district. But we'll keep trying. Uh, I want you guys to ask me some questions about my experiences, any advice, or tell me a little something about yourselves. You know, you want to talk about, have you thought about what you're going to do yeah. after high school? What would you like to do? Stop for I'm going to be a rich man or a poor man, one of the two. <laughs> what about you? Uh, I think I want to go with engineering management and sell like a product for big um, like tech companies or engineering firms. You get, you know, it's good because you're focused. It's not, well, I want, I want to do something in business, you know. Yeah. What about you? you I'm being in computer science. Yeah, I, trust me, I, I call the geek squad a lot, needing help. <laughs> so, yeah. try and figure it out. Sooner the better, because then you zero in. And, uh, you know, I don't know if business or what investment in I don't know if banking is so good right now. I don't know. <laughs> and you? There you go. Good for you. And uh, it's good to even be thinking along those lines because it, it really helped me. And. Uh, I, my, I exceeded anything I could have possibly, you know, thought of. Uh, I mean, I would have been happy uh, writing for the Portable Recorder, which I did in 1965. For the I had summer jobs, first at Porterville, then I did an internship at the Tillery Advanced Register. And I worked at the Visalia Times Delta for a year and a half before I went to L.A. And I went to kind of the number two paper in L.A. It was called the L.A. Herald Examiner. And uh, I was lucky. I, I was 27 years old. And I was like, the sports department had 22 people in it. And I, was, I started at the very bottom. And things just... <coughs> You know, people left the paper, there was different circumstances, and the sports editor 
got ousted and they called me in and I was 27 years old and they said, you're now, you're now in charge. We'll make you the assistant sports editor while we create a search to hire a sports editor. And, uh, but they said, you'll still be a candidate for the sports editor job. Well, I don't, I knew that that wasn't the case, but here I was 27 years old and running a sports department in a major newspaper. And kind of mind boggling. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. I was just a slightly better than average student. I was not a protege. My first stories here, if you get a chance to look at these, they all started the same. Strathmore, the Strathmore Spartans beat the Leighton Mustangs Friday night uh, in their first home game, 28. That was my lead for every story. I just, I just wanted to point out to the, the students that back in those days, like there was no internet and there was only a handful of channels. So everybody got their information from the newspapers or the radio or TV, but like it was a much, it was a very, very important part of society and where people got their information. So, you know, writing in the paper was, um, was a huge deal. It was a deal. prestigious job. Very prestigious job and it was, you know, there weren't a lot of sources of information back in those days. So, you know, how many, how many channels were on the TV? Just a handful, right? We got, we got one channel. We right? got three I when I was growing up. So, three TV channels. So there was no internet, no social media, none of that. So this was the way lots of people got their information for everything. And that's also where you wanted to buy a, a car or, you know, buy things. You had the classified ads. So this was, this was the main avenue where people got information for all kinds of things. So it was a, very prestigious, very important. Um, way of getting information in those days. You know how you guys look up sports stats right as soon as they're happening on the internet? We would run to the store to pick up for the court in the morning to read about what happened that we just watched the night before. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up here, everybody read the Fresno Bee. It was delivered. We lived three miles up each side of town. There was a little tube the delivery guy went to every house and delivered the Fresno Bee. It came in the afternoon back then. And so I would go right to the sports page and I knew the baseball standings were right there. I could see, I knew exactly how the standings were. I was just grabbed, there was, I have an older brother, a slightly older brother, but nobody else in my family was interested in sports. I didn't have a TV until I was in this grade, I guess, but I saw the 19, I'm dating myself, the 1955 World Series at a neighbor's house, and I just was gravity. I just thought that was the neatest thing ever. Then the Dodgers and Giants moved to San Francisco, the Dodgers to LA and the Giants to San Francisco in 1958, and I thought, gee, I might actually get to see a Major League Baseball game in person, not knowing that I would be. One perk of my job, I actually <coughs> call the team, so I could go to any game I wanted and sit in the press box and the food was free. And I mean, Super Bowl like Andrew was say, saying that, that, that newspaper, I mean, if you were a sports writer at a major paper, boy, they rolled out the red carpet. Anything you want, Mr. Stewart. You know, you got treated royally because newspapers were the way, the main way to communicate. How many Super Bowls have you been to? Uh, um, Eleven. Not that many. <laughs> so I have more than I've gone to. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great. I love Super Bowl weeks. The, my favorite was a terrible game, but uh, the uh, 1990, they should have every Super Bowl in New Orleans. I mean, you're there all week. And so they, where the media is, it's a huge center, and everything is free. The food, I'm open 24 hours a day. I think they finally, there was a particular sports writer on our staff. We called him all Mr. Hospitality because he was always hanging out where the free drinks were. But, and there were parties. There were just so, there were so many parties one night in New Orleans that one week that, I'm like, I went to a CBS radio party and this and that, and I'm walking along and I see private party in this restaurant, the Paul's Kitchen that I'd heard of. I said, oh, I wonder what's going on there. I look in and I see an ESPN sign. Well, I covered 
ESPN, I knew it. So I knocked, oh, come on in. <laughs> and uh, a, a really good friend of mine uh, was playing that game. He played at Visalia at Mount Whitney High School. A guy named uh, Michael Young was a wide receiver for the Broncos, and his family was down. And, and the president of NFL Films, or all of you from my NFL Films, does all of the NFL footage. The president took me and my friend Michael Young out to dinner at some five-star restaurant. The prices weren't on the menu. <coughs> I, it, I've had so many great experiences. I could harp on a lot, but this was this was a, a a pretty a pretty good week. But the game was terrible. I had inside information: the 49ers beat the Broncos. 55 to 10, it was a blowout. Well, myself and my counterpart for USA Today, we were going to be on TV, and so was uh, Michael Young, who was a wide receiver for the Broncos, and uh, Michael Sherrard, who was a wide receiver for the 49ers. Well, they were teammates when they were at UCLA. So I mentioned to my friend Michael Young, I said, yeah, I'm going to be, we're going to be on TV too. And it was like, we were going to be on Ride With Him. He says, well, why don't you ride with, you know, they're sending a limo for us. Well, they didn't send limos for sports riders. But he says, come to the, our hotel and you can ride over in the limo with us. So those two guys are just talking. And when the Broncos came into town, the coach says, okay, get it out of your system. They said if the photographer would have been out taking pictures, they could have gotten John Elway, the quarterback for the Broncos, down on all fours throwing up in the street at 5 a.m. in the morning. And so Michael's saying, we've had the worst practices ever. And Mike Sherrard is saying, Bill Walsh wasn't the, their legendary coach. It was, uh, I can't think of it. Uh, but uh, the, he, Michael Sherrard is saying, no, we've had the great, greatest practices. So I'm not a gambler, but I should have put some money down on, on, the, on the 49ers. And I knew an, uh, a, a teammate of Michael Young, he played at Mount Whitney High School. They won a Valley Championship in 1979. It was one of, considered one of the great teams in the history of, of California. They had four guys on that team that ended up, no, three ended up going to the NFL. And uh, so one of Michael's teammates, I just talked to him, he's coming with me to the, the dinner on like Lupe Sanchez. Oh, here we are. Yeah, great guy. How many, what's, what's any of you, the most famous person you've talked to? Josh Allen. Okay. Who's that? Josh Allen. Can you talk a little bit about the people you rode around in limousines and have dinner with? Well, my first chapter is on about Charles Barkley. He, a lot of people used to ask me, who is your favorite person to interview? And I, you know, there, there's so many I could think. But Barclay is, he's a crack up, just like he is on those Capital One commercials. You see him on there with Samuel L. Jackson and Magic Johnson and, and uh, uh, Jim Nance, some, and, and uh, uh, he's just hilarious. And, so what I, the anecdote I lead my book with is we meet at a hotel and I ride with Charles and I can interview him and he's on with on a late night show then hosted by Jay Leno. And so it, I did it once and every time after that, that Charles would come in to be on one of the late night shows. It's either Jimmy Kimmel or with then Jay Leno. And uh, we had such a good time the first time, so I did it like a dozen times, did a ride along. And one of them, we're getting close to NBC, and the limo has a flat tire. And we pull off to the side, <coughs> and the help is, is supposed, somebody's supposed to show up from NBC, it was an NBC limo. And we don't, so eventually I get out of the limo, and I'm standing next to Charles, who's like this. And both of us are just watching the pretty, the people do double takes as they drive by on the, on the freeway. But uh, Frank Gifford, who's from Bakersfield, was one of my, he was one of the announcers on Monday Night Football for 27 years. Another great guy. And I had kind of a, 
a bond with him because his dad worked in the oil fields. He claimed he had lived in 43 different towns. I bet saw another interview where he said 47, whatever it was a lot. He lived in Avenel for one week. He actually went to school in Alpha at one time. And of course he could mention all these. He knew, he liked to rattle off all these names, so he was one of my favorite people to interview. He was a Hall of Fame football player for the New York Giants and a broadcaster. And he was very close to the Kennedy family. Through him I got to meet Ted Kennedy once. That was a brother of JFK who got assassinated. I was sitting in the Strathmore Library the day uh, John Kennedy was shot and so we were taking a test and the principal came in and almost yelled, the president has been shot. And the library is a lot different <laughs> than this library. And then he came back soon and said the president had died. It's one of those moments in history that you always kind of remember, like a lot of you might remember the day that Kobe Bryant was killed in a helicopter crash. Does that ring a bell? I got to know uh, Pete Sampras and John McEnroe fairly well. Uh, Pete Sampras' brother-in-law is a really good friend of mine. I saw him out at the uh, golf course. Uh, got to know Billie Jean King fairly well. Uh, I played tennis. Not not on the high school team. I picked it up after high school. Charles, did you have a question or? Oh no. no. Uh, ask me some other questions. You know, I I I think I started to emphasize though of all the people, of all the famous and rich people that I've interviewed and gotten to know and maybe established relationship with. Trust me, nobody has a perfect life. Some of the famous people that I've interviewed and hear how miserable they are. I'm just like, you're rich and famous and you're miserable. It's not the events that happen to you. It's the bad events. It's how you handle it. You know, everybody can sit around and just complain. I'm a positive person. When somebody starts complaining too much, I just say, well, good talking to you and I like to move on. Let's try a couple more pictures, and then we'll let you guys get back to practice. Yeah, I gotta get a little practice time out of them before they get picked up. We've only got about 20, 30 minutes or so, so I'll get them back out. Yeah. Let me just run through that. This is a different screen saver with a push and hold. And we're working on getting the court taken care of. Is that? We're working on that. Getting the court again. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just real quick and I'll let you guys go. I like to call this picture. Bob Mathias went to Tulare High School. He was two times he was the Olympic decathlon champion in 1948 and 1952. He was considered the best athlete in the world. And I mentioned Bill Sharman earlier, so I was at a function, I think, in 2007, and so I, I knew both of these. I first met Bob Mathias at the Portable Recorder when he was running for uh, Assemblyman. Uh, so I wanted to get this and say, title it, Three Tulare County Legends, you know, maybe in the third, right, sarcastically. And the photographer had... Uh, this gray-haired gentleman get in the picture. Have any of you heard of John Wooden? Does that name mean anything to you? Basketball coach? Name, is named the greatest sports coach yes. in yes. history. Right. Yeah, the yeah, 20th yeah, century. He's the most okay, we got the right. final four coming up. John Wooden won 10 national championships at UCLA over a 12-year span. And with the 10th, then he was hired. But anyway, I'll let you guys go. I appreciate you coming in. I love some of my stories, and even though we were a small group, but remember, think about it. It really helps to focus on a certain particular goal. If you're going to become a doctor, hey, it may not work out, but 
if you're working toward that goal, and there may be a fork in the road, make sure you take the right fork. Thanks, guys.